iPredict works by gathering the knowledge of its 5,000 plus traders. If a stock has a price of 57 cents, that means the market thinks that event has a 57% chance of happening. If you agree, you buy. If you disagree, you short. And if you're right, you make money. Kia ora, good evening New Zealand. This is day 16 until the country goes to the polls. Welcome to iPredict Election 2011, the most accurate source of political and economic information in New Zealand broadcasting. Our three predictions tonight. Prediction one, the iPredict market are currently predicting New Zealand First will gain 4.1% of the party vote. Can New Zealand First break 5%? Prediction two, the iPredict market is saying there is an 87% probability that John Key will have a public cup of tea with John Banks. If National believe they have a majority, will they bother? And even if it happens, is it enough to save ACT? Prediction 3. Treasury are predicting our current account deficit will be 2.4% by the start of next year, while the iPredict market is predicting 3.4%. Is the government's optimism terribly misplaced as we face global markets still reeling from the fallout of the 2008 collapse? To dissect these predictions, let me introduce tonight's panel. He is the editor of the largest independent news site in New Zealand, the ever-brilliant scoop.co.nz's Selwyn Manning. And he is one of the most mercurial barnstormers on the New Zealand political landscape, the ever sartorial leader of New Zealand First, Winston Peters. Welcome to you both. We'll also wrap the show with a final prediction, but let's kick things off with tonight's first market prediction. New Zealand First's core principles of economic sovereignty have never had so much resonance as the global economic situation turns from bad to worst. However, in the last election, after one of the most prolonged media feeding frenzies focusing on New Zealand First donations, they failed to cross the 5% threshold. Can New Zealand First enter Parliament in 2011? Selwyn, who are the constituents of New Zealand First? <coughs> what do they want from Winston? Oh, I think the man on your right would know the constituency of New Zealand First far better than me, but it seems to me that what uh, is manifest at the moment in the whole of the New Zealand politics, and particularly in the last three years, is a lack of decisive, strong leadership. Mm. Um, if you look at each of the leaders of the parties that have been represented in the New Zealand Parliament, since the 2008 election, it has been sadly lacking in leadership. Mm. If we look at all of these issues, basically the crapper farm issues, if you look at the way the, ca the, uh, the, the economy has been handled, mm. if you look at job creation strategies, they're all sadly lacking in the New Zealand political landscape. In some ways, we can see that New Zealand first could have made a very, very strong contribution on each of those points. Mm. The reasons that you alluded to of uh, you know, leading up to New Zealand First's exit in the polls, I, I agree with, with your, your, your summary there. I, I think there was a feeding frenzy that began during a, a, a foreign affairs trip to the United mm. States that the uh, egos of the press gallery, um, which is usually a toothless body half of the time, yes. but they put their false teeth in and went for the jugular. Mm. And at the end of the day, many people would probably find some of the policies that were pushed or the rhetoric around New Zealand First position in the past, perhaps abhorrent at times on the immigration thing. But the New Zealand public has sadly um, been let down, I think, one, by mainstream media, mm -hmm. and two, through a lack of leadership of the other parties, being able to assume that position that was once there. Winston, let's get into it. You were cleared by three separate investigations into New Zealand First donations, yet there is still a chunk of your former support base we feel that is the voice that raged against corporate influence in politics, the donations investigations damaged their perception of you. What would you say to those former supporters when the market says you are so close to the 5% threshold? What would you say to bring them back? What I would say to them is that there were people who were always opposed to Winston Peters and New Zealand First mm. because they are the elitist, uh, the foreign ownership group, the privileged who want to run the country for the few and the very few and mainly themselves. And so anybody like Winston Peters and New Zealand First stood to stand in their way. So they were prepared to tell five months of lies about New Zealand First. As you know, there were three inquiries. Mm. Not one of those inquiries ever came to me. Mm. Yet the media told you that the inquiries were into me. See how fascinating this is? But they weren't interested in the truth. They were just interested in getting rid of me. And uh, the ACT Party started, backed by the National Party and Business Roundtable. And hence, that's what happened. But 95,000 stayed loyal, and I'm counting on them to convince others, including themselves, to be there come election night 2011. 
But you look at a mere culpa to those followers, those, those previous people. I mean, New Zealand First was rating well above 5%. In the days when you when you strode, but that's why. They, but that's why they attacked us. Yep, of course. Because they, the last thing they want is to share power. That's why they're for first past the post. Mm. That's why they're for systems, which are first past the post in drag, such as some of the other ones that these other parties are putting up. In essence, this is about democracy and having to share power and having to have values which the countries can the country can go forward on. And the great things about New Zealand First and what I've stood for over the years is. Uh, the day of reckoning has come, hasn't it? Mm. For savings, we're broke. For foreignership, that's one of the reasons why we're broke. There's a countless lot of things, there's countless things being said now by other parties where you know that's New Zealand first home. For them, those statements are a foreign country. Do you feel bitter at the, at the mainstream media? <laughs> you can't afford to be bitter in this business. You've got uh, life to live and there's, something, there's more important things than just uh, sort of succeeding in winning. Uh, but I feel ashamed that we live in a democracy that's had an unbroken line of elections for 150 years. Only nine countries can say that, and yet you have got in this campaign a political party that got more than four of the parties in Parliament to vote in total being blacklisted day after day, yeah. every day in the media. The Herald runs the policies of every party on every issue every day now, not New Zealand First. Yeah. Won't have an article about New Zealand First. Everything is shut down. We pack halls. The rest have telephone booth meetings and they get coverage. But look, that's the kind of uh, f what I call fascist behavior that belongs in North Korea we have to put up with. Then you don't wimp and cry and weasel about it. You get out there and you make sure that they don't triumph because a lot hinges on these sorts of people not winning and not running this country. With, with New Zealand First cut out, cut out of the TVNZ debates, is there a mainstream media bias against Winston and does he deserve it? Uh, we'll answer the first part of that question. Yeah, clearly. I think every person out there that's a reasonably minded New Zealander would have been able to come up with that conclusion themselves. Mm. Um, <laughs> where, 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 it, where it goes from here is really up to the people. Mm. You know, we, we do live in a democracy. We do have a choice on the 26th of November. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I think, what you think, even with respect to uh, what Mr. Peters thinks. It matters what the people out there think. Mm. My, my view is here is I, I, I actually think, if, you know, I'm not a fluttering, you know, punting kind of guy, but if you're looking at the I predict thing, I think it's a bit low. Mm. I, I think that people out there will look at those two leaders that are dominating the leaders' debates at the moment. And, you know, both of them probably have their talents. Mm. Um, I observed Phil Goff as a trade minister, um, and obviously he was in the same um, arena as Mr. Peters for a long time. He has his talents. Same with John Key. You don't get to that point in office without having your talents. But at the same time, I see a lack of strategic positioning of policies that are going to convince the wider public that New Zealand is going to be served well by these characters. Mm. And I kind of think that there may be a spillover for the other third parties. And really, New Zealand First is a known brand. It's not a newcomer to mm. the election here. Um, just the same as the Greens have their brand, or well, Mana is developing its brand. And I, I, I think it's got every chance to go over the fight. How just just, yep, just yep. one thing there. Yep. You know why John Key won't back Winston Peters? because he's got no memory of the history of this country, and particularly recent history, and he, what, he would not win that debate. I'm not a put off with all his penguin hand-waving and laughing and jeering. I'm interested in the facts. And on the facts, his record is, a, is as a non-performer as a leader. You know, there, there's some, some things you know, that, that come into play here. And I, I can remember in the, uh, when you were treasurer, you know, it was perhaps one of the first times that really the New Zealand public started to actually digest the consequences of the sales, the massive sales mm. that have taken oh, yes, place. Yeah. The current account deficit became a household word, mm. really. Mm. People understood it. It's taken all of this time in Parliament and all of this, this energy that has gone into it, but we still have that problem. And I kind of wonder, mm. where did we miss the boat? even with yourself in there, championing that type of thing, to actually achieve the gains for New Zealand this far well, out? Well, I remember the first thing I did was I thought that the New Zealand people would understand the problem we were in, in comparison with Australia. It's, it's 992, Australia's gone for a compulsory savings regime. Now they've saved trillions. I offered the New Zealand people not ram it through Parliament like Cullen did. I offered them a referendum, and I thought that the people of this country would see the crisis we were in which was, I give you 8% tax cut, 
painless for you, you save it in this account, we free ourselves up from foreign money. And the Labour and National Party and the Business Roundtable all came out and attacked me. We lost the referendum. That's when it went wrong, and I tell you why. Here comes the day of reckoning 14 days later, 14 years later, we're broke. Mm. But alongside that, remember the other thing I pushed for was we recognised what we always were, an export dependent nation, where we got the maximum of export policy advantages, added value, and that nearly all of our policies, including immigration, education, science, research and development, would be around an export focus. Treble our exports, try and compete with Singapore and uh, Norway and countries like that in terms of the level of exports they've got per person. We would not be looking at our crisis now. Along comes the global financial crisis, 2008, 2007, 2009. Singapore, Norway didn't even blink. Mm. Us? I think we've got blood, sweat and tears coming now. But it's not just in the banking sectors and, mm. and, and all of that type of thing, is it? You know, the current, current account deficit has other contributors to that problem as well. For example, in a core constituency, I would imagine, of New Zealand First, is the older adult. You know, uh, mm. the overseas private investment of, mm. of our rest homes, our continuing care units, yeah. all of that type of thing with the taxpayer money goes across to pay overseas investors mm. uh, where mm -hmm. the profits are then siphoned off overseas and then the politicians are saying we are you know having a problem with the current account deficit to me <laughs> I I anyone out there can see mm. the problems why mm. is it apart from those reasons you already outlined that there's been a lack of momentum on this type of thing for over 15 years yeah well you could come up with a lot of answers but the one that's compellingly uh, unavoidable is that they have the political system in their pocket. There's no other explanation for it. I'll give you an example. Why would telecoms that were sold mid-1990 get a 21-year monopoly to price gouge every business and every consumer in New Zealand? Unless they've got the political system in their pocket. You, or, or, or the system's totally stupid. No, they, they won't admit that, will they? <laughs> so it's all no, about it stakeholder groups both, manipulating. No, they have stakeholder mm. groups are manipulating and have got the political system in their pocket. Uh, yeah. Look, I tell you, this is true. It's 1998. I promised you, remember, mm. a full-scale investigation by Treasury, and I had it done, into uh, communications pricing in this country. They came out and presented me the paper saying we've got to bust these people. Treasury did it. Mm. Right. Then the next thing that comes is presentation to me that we've got to sell contact energy and dump on the elderly people, take their super down to 60%. I refused all three, I'm gone within a week. One of the, one of They've the got the system in their mm. pocket and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Quit. I was around long before any of those National Party people were in the National Party and I know how it works. A question to both of you, at 4% party vote for New Zealand First, would you buy that stock because you, you, you think it's going to be higher or would you short it because Winston yeah, won't get above 4? No, you'd, you'd, you'd buy it. You'd buy it? Yeah. Um, one, one, one of the things just on that, is, mm. what, though, it's conditional too, in the sense that I, I think a lot of people in this country vote for a party and a leader and its, and its, and its candidates with the idea that it might be actually in office. Mm. And that... that that, uh, looking at the statements on the weekend, I kind of wonder whether or not the people are thinking, is there power in opposition? And, and that seemed to be where well, you're Well, the problem on the weekend was, and this is a classic, isn't it? You haven't seen one word as to why I made that statement on the weekend. Well, except I, on the, Scoop. No, on Scoop, yes. yes. But not in the main media, mm. not on radio TV. They all instantly decided that they would eliminate that. And I'm telling you why we did it. We will never make it, no matter what we do, if we go down the separatist pathway that leads to Zimbabwe and former South Africa of one rule for one people and a different rule for others. Now, I made it very clear, I'm not for two flags, I'm not for a separate prison system, justice system, education system. I'm not for the foreshore and seabed being owned by one group at the expense of the many. And I'm not for a UN declaration which says that in a dispute between the indigenous people, or some of them, and the rest of the population, their view will prevail. I'll give you six compelling reasons why you cannot deal with National Labour, the Greens and Māori, because one is pushing the agenda, and the other three haven't got the guts and the courage to say, this is a disaster for my grandchildren. I want my children to have a country that, and a future like I had, and it's not in the pathway to separatism. And until they understand that, then there is no compromise 
no bottom line that we were prepared to, to live with. However, I hope one day our view prevails, prevails and common sense to return to this country. Thank you, panel. Let's move on to prediction two. The market is predicting that there is an 87% chance of a public endorsement by John Key of John Banks in a desperate attempt to turn Epsom for ACT and provide National with a coalition partner to the right. So, and if National Party hierarchy think they have an outright majority, as the landline poll suggests, why would Key have a cuppa with Banks? Because he's, uh, it, you know, it, we're in an MMP environment. You know, what, what they're going for there with banks is for the electorate to actually vote him in mm. a, as an MP. That's what National's trying to seduce there. Mm. They know that it's better to do that and then see the, the voter, the punter, if you like, mm. put their party list tick on National so they win both sides. That's the strategy behind it. And I think we have to look at it from that point of view. Mm. There's a moral issue to this too. And, th and this, is, this is one of the things, ironically, that those inside National would actually point out as a failing of MMP and yet they're the worst ones at it. You mm. know, is that trying to swindle uh, the, the voting public and trying to actually dictate to them which way their vote's going to go? Winston, as the party that suffered most from the outrageous fortune of MMP that allowed ACT representation with a lower party vote than New Zealand First, are you enjoying the anguish John Banks and Don Brash are going through right now? No, what happened in this country was that a guy in a yellow jacket told a tissue of lies to, 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 to uh, press people media people who wanted to believe it. And they were as guilty as he was. Never apologise, of course, when they've all proven to be wrong. But the real point is you've got fraud and deceit and contempt for democracy going on in Epsom, and it brings to mind an old English word, cuckold. That's what's going on here. It's actually... Sounds better than bauble. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a stench about it. Hmm. And I don't, you know, we didn't want to be part of it, frankly, and uh, uh, if that's the way they have, uh, that Epsom voters think is a fair way to treat them, then they deserve what they get. Because they are the masters come the 26th of November, they can straighten this sort of thing out. Question to both of you, even if John Key tells them what to do, what will Epsom do? On Campbell Live last night, there was a genuine I won't vote for John Banks mentality. Would you short the 67% probability of that, will it? Look, John Key's behaviour on this matter is fraudulent. And the people of Epsom can see that. And I think they can't be told now by anyone that they finally have decided this despite the way they've been abused and misused and conveniently so at their own volition have decided now that they might be uh, responsible human beings and vote uh, and vote how they please and the act party is therefore gone well they do if if if, if, the, if the word comes down from head office are uh, epsomites going to vote the way john key wants them to? well you know uh, matthew hooten he, he would say he knows the electorate better than anyone well, he's, he's lived in there. it since he was yep, born into yep, it yep um, my, my view outside would <laughs> be that maybe epsom still holds a lot of people that actually uh, subscribe to a conservative politics that those people that actually put christine fletcher in all of those years mm, mm. actually still exist and still breathe in the electorate mm. that actually want to actually give an indication to the party of where their core values sit. And if that's the case, well, you know, you, you wouldn't put your money on ACT winning, would you? It's a right. train wreck of a party at the best of times, yeah. let alone what it's been presenting the last three years. With the market predicting 87% eight, predicting probability of a public deal, would you buy because oh. John Key will need the friends or short because National believe they've got the majority? Uh, I'll put all of that to the side, the mm. calculations to the side, and just speak to the point. John Key has already seduced this, mm. this idea out there. It, he might as well have that meeting tomorrow. Right. The, the fact of the matter is, is they're trying to actually get momentum amongst their stakeholder groups, mm. their, their, their committees and everybody on the ground, which National lost when Christine Fletcher moved off the patch. Um, yeah, and, and you're right. What he's doing is saying yes with a nod and not words. Right. Mm. That's a script, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You know, it shows what uh, contempt of it is. And if the nod doesn't work as the polls close, right up about the Monday or Tuesday of the closing of the last week, he will then say yes verbally. Right, right. Just in case right. anybody's missed the message. <laughs> Thank you, panel. <laughs> Moving on to prediction three. Treasury are predicting our current account deficit will be 2.4% by the start of next year, while the iPredict market is predicting 3.4%. Is the government's optimism terribly misplaced as we face global markets still reeling from the fallout of the 2008 collapse? So, and since the pre fu the economy has gone from bad to worse. Figures released today show that for the first quarter of the new financial year, GST revenue fell by 4.2%. Individual tax take was down by a staggering 13.2% and corporate tax take was down 3.2%. Is the enormity of this recession outside Treasury's ability to predict? 
Well, it, 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 it's, it's on a roller coaster, and I think it's a little bit like a tiger by the tail. And that tiger has no cage and it has no constraints. It has mm. no, no policies wrapped around it to actually try and get it into a situation where you can see where it's going to go. I think that's where Treasury... I mean, Mr. Peters is a former treasurer mm. in, in the 96 to 99 period. Now, you know, what we saw coming out of, uh, you know, the, the government's bodies this morning was Reserve Bank, and this is the Reserve Bank's headline on its statement. Turbulent global markets continue to affect New Zealand. Uh, we look at the New Zealand Treasury, and this is the New Zealand Treasury's mm. headline. New Zealand government financial statements for September quarter goes into the statement are basically dire. And right. it gives all the reasons for that, and like what you outlined there. What it does say is the cause and effect we don't really know the effect that is what, what, uh, from the statement if right. you look at that, but we certainly know the causes. And that was the government's revenue gathering policies when it came in. Mr. Peters talked about a little bit earlier about R&D for export markets. Mm. You know, uh, the New Zealand dollar is going down. That was a part of what we saw out of these statements this morning. Uh, most export-led governments would actually take advantage of that. Mm. We see nothing from this party that's in, in government of leadership, at the moment. Yeah. It, it's Winston, the, the, the Dow dropped almost 400 points this morning. Italy's debt is beyond its ability mm. to pay. And the IMF today warned Europe could plunge the global economy into a decade of lost growth. Has this government prepared us for the second dip of the recession? What radical solutions do you think are needed? Well, first of all, the day of breaking that brought us to this where there was an international crisis and we were th seriously imperiled by it, the circumstances that brought us to this was the lack of vision and preparation in the past about which I spoke a bit earlier. Mm. Other countries did, Singapore, Norway as two good examples, and Australia, barely a hiccup, not us, we're in crisis here. Second thing is, the May budget was not worth the papers it was written on. And nor was the last uh, week uh, economic update before the election not worth the papers written on. And I'll give you a, a, a few reasons why, but maybe the, the main reason. It's February, and Mr. Key says that the asset sales is going to be to pay down debt. That's in the May budget, isn't it? Mm. That's in the economic update. But within three days of that, he was up there at Cavity Coast saying, funny enough, we're not going to pay down debt. I ask you the question. So what was the May budget based on and what was the economic update based on? Well, it's based on a fiction for which Treasury is actually quite famous. And this, to make sure they covered their bureaucratic derrieres, they said there's a one in five chance that we're wrong. Well, it's far higher than that. Mm. I'm not being a do merchant here and I, I believe there's a way out. But it is now a collective sacrifice of us all with policies that across the divide that the people can accept are now the premiums to get us out of this. But can you do that from opposition? I, mm. I'm, well, most certainly you can. I tell you what I did in opposition, back the Cullen Fund, otherwise it would never have started. Back the Kiwi Bank, otherwise never had the votes. Back Kiwi Saver, otherwise didn't have the votes. You ask Cullen, we got all those things going and wrote the foreshore and seabed so that everybody owned the foreshore and seabed in 19, uh, sorry, in 2004. But don't you need friends in, in, in well, the yes, executive but, well, well, to Of course you it? need friends and you know, they need to have uh, the capacity to pass votes as well. What do you think you do in opposition when somebody comes to course and says to you, look, we'd like you for your support on this. And the answer is, well, if that policy is one that you can live with, you don't just say yes. You say yes, and so what are you going to do for this policy which you know this country needs? That's how you get things so done. you know how opposition. to deal? You know how to deal? Well, I'm, exper I'm, look, I'm not being arrogant here, but I'm seriously experienced, and no one said I'm soft. So we, we get far greater returns for our vote than anybody else question, has. Question of both of you. And that's why they kept on insisting that the tail is wagging the dog, which is nonsense. I wish the tail had a wag the dog <laughs> on compulsory savings, <laughs> on an export policy, because we wouldn't be in the crap we're in now. Uh, question of both of you, touching on a theme that you've uh, been talking about, Mr. Peters. As we face a crisis of capitalism akin to the 1929 stock market collapse, will we also face the same type of political and social pressures that confronted the 1930s? A couple of press releases ago, you were talking about uh, if we didn't get on top of the unemployment youth issue in this country, we would be seeing the kind of social disruptions that London was going through. What are your thoughts? I believe that. Mm. Now, you may not, you, you, that's not an excuse for violence and mayhem in the streets, but these are the kind of things that trigger it when people think to themselves, with good evidence, this system is not fair at all. I'll give you an example. 
a guy <laughs> seriously in front of the court because of defrauding investors, and he got, what, home detention in Sydney. This is outrageous. Mm. Right, another guy throws a rock through a jewelry shop, he might have only taken $600, he's getting time in prison. Mm. Now, a lot of people have been to say this country is not fair, that there are, <laughs> there's an inequality. We lost $8 billion of many elderly people money in all sorts of finance houses who's gone to prison. Madoff will be out before these people go in. Now, South Canterbury Finance, $800 million was the cost when it was underwritten by the taxpayer. So how did it get to 1.6? That's twice the cost. Mm. It's because this genius, Mr. Key, who keeps on telling everybody and the media keep on saying knows how to run the country, didn't put a cap on further indebtedness. Mm. So it goes from 800 to 1.6 billion. The taxpayer now is down the tubes for $1 billion. Who got that money? Mm. Well, you and I know who did, mainly the National Party's mates. So if you want to see the, the um, recipe for disaster and mayhem in the streets, it's when people learn that there is a different law for some. Uh, the market predicts the current account deficit will be 3.4%, while Treasury says only 24 Would you buy that stock? Because economic conditions will get worse or shorter because Treasury are all seeing oracles no, who know, who know about this you're recession. Buying. You're saying buying? Mm. Will we see the kind of political stresses, for, uh, stresses and pressures? There's always a cause and there's always an effect. We know when the economy is going bad, it's bad for everybody. And mm. the worst thing is, is for those that are trying to actually assume their potential, that they are not able to reach that when that happens. Thank you, panel. Let's wrap the show with the final prediction. Sal, in your final prediction this evening, it's... Well, it's a, an interesting one. I'd say let's look South Island. Mm. Uh, why Makariri Electric? Yep. Clayton yep. Cosgrove there. He's campaigning without even labour on his, on, on, right. on his, on, on his tickets. I, I would suggest that at 70 cents, that's worth a buy. Oh, you know, really? I, I think be Clayton Cosgrove knows his electric, and I think some of this uh, kind of, um, well, it's jaundiced to say the least, kind of pollock politicking around the irrigation kind of issues mm. that we're seeing at the moment. He should be able to turn that into a vote and I'd say he'll be back. Winston, your final prediction? Well, I'd uh, take a punt and bet you're right on that one as well. Mm. Uh, and my final prediction is that uh, the so-called uh, kindergarten polls that are happening in this country will be found to be dramatically long, uh, wrong as we close to election day. Uh, thank you, Winston. Thank you, Sal. And to my final prediction, I predict launched a new stock that National would have over 50% party vote, seeing as National are currently predicted to have 47% party vote by the market. This is an easy short. Tomorrow night, I am joined by United Future leader Peter Dunn and blogger Phoebe Fletcher. Follow me on my Citizen Bomber Twitter and Facebook accounts for all my latest election updates. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again tomorrow, 7 p.m. for I Predict Election 2011, exclusively on Stratus TV. Until then, get trading.